umami. It is the fifth taste, the essence of flavor, the secret to deliciousness. At least that's what any content creator worth their monosodium salt will tell you. But if you take that belief and expose it to just a little bit of heat and some sugary scrutiny, you'll realize what chefs like me already know. That's not entirely accurate. What? Which part? You do not need umami for something to be delicious. If you think that's contentious, well, you've clearly never lost all self-control to a bowl of fresh sugary donuts. And if you think umami is one of only five tastes, well, this video may just completely break how you understand flavor. So before we go any deeper, let's be clear on a couple of things. Number one, yes, umami does mean when translated from Japanese delicious taste. Number two, MSG is a neurotransmitter and it can enhance the perception of other tastes. And number three, it just so happens that one of the principal molecules for triggering the sensation of umami is present in really high amounts in a lot of foods that we find delicious. In this Marmite, for example, two grams per hundred, 2% 2 MSG. Now links to papers used in this video are all in the description if you'd like to read a little deeper. But in taking the importance of umami at face value and assuming that the reason that certain foods taste good is because of the presence of MSG misses a deeper truth. MSG in these foods is merely the smoke, not the fire itself. It's the same misstep as saying that citrus fruit is good for you because of vitamin C. Now, I'm not saying that vitamin C isn't good for you and I'm not saying that it certainly doesn't cure scurvy all by itself. No, what I am saying is the reason that soy sauce, parmesan, fish garum, miso are all delicious and the reasons that we should eat whole foods instead of relying on supplements, yes, even the most expensive ones that you can't get away from. So if somebody is not taking testosterone, drink AG1. It was 90 quid. The reason is a bit more complicated. And don't just take my word on this. Here is a quote from Linda Bartoshuk, a flavor scientist from the University of Florida. She says, I don't think glutamates play as big a role in the flavor of things like tomatoes and cheese as people claim. I think that's exaggerated. But if it's not umami as I'm arguing, then what does make food delicious? Well, liking this video and subscribing to this channel, of course. But to understand, we need to go a little bit deeper and revisit how the tongue functions. As of today, there are five firm tastes that scientists agree on. And it's no coincidence that these closely align with the different molecules that we need for life. Now the five tastes as we know and love them are number one, salty. So salt is incredibly important for fluid balance, for nerve conduction, and also energy transfer within the body and within the cell. Number two is sourness. So sourness is triggered by acids and acids are a really important group in life and in chemistry. Their presence helps the food to be safe for us to eat as it kind of restricts the growth of certain microbes that are dangerous to us. Citric acid is also at the heart of our cellular metabolism and is just incredibly vital for all of life. It's carried throughout every living thing that we see. Uh, number three, we have sweet. So sweet is one of the main ones to do with things that contain energy. So sugars are incredibly energy dense and a really important fuel for our body. So it's obviously no coincidence that sweet things taste good to us. So bitter compounds is a very broad category and we can detect a lot of different classes of molecules with that taste. And it's not so much that these are essential to life, it's quite often that these are essential to not dying as bitter compounds are ones that our body believes may be poisonous. So if that flavor is triggered, it's saying to us that you need to be careful how much of this you're eating. But as we consume more and more of them, like those in coffee and really dark chocolate, we begin to get accustomed to them and can really enjoy their flavor. And number five is umami. And the receptors for umami are especially sensitive to compounds like MSG that are salts of amino acids and also nucleotides, which are a really important building block in DNA and obviously, again, really important for life. So that's the five main tastes, but there are other taste-like sensations that we all know. One of them is kukumi. So kukumi is probably the strongest candidate to become the sixth taste, but we can't detect it by itself. In order to sense kukumi, we need other molecules, and it works a bit like an AND logic gate. A kukumi triggering molecule like a peptide, a short chain of amino acids, by itself does very little and it doesn't activate the taste. When you have a peptide plus another taste molecule like sugar or MSG, that's when it's sensed, creating an additional dimension to taste that enhances sweet, salty, and umami tastes too. Now, kukumi is an important element of the taste of aged mesos. So the molecules that trigger kukumi can be short peptides, and these are produced in mesos after a very long time. 
But what's even more interesting is that the Kakumi receptor responsible for detecting these peptides is called something else, the calcium sensing receptor. And it also detects, I really hope you get this, calcium. And when I first read this, I immediately understood why it is that chefs and others pay silly money, sometimes over 200 times the amount for normal table salt, for fancy salt like fleur de sel, because it contains other salts like calcium, producing a subtly more complex taste. Not only do you get a boost in saltiness, which enhances flavor, you get a triggering of kukumi, which further increases flavor through this logic and gate kind of mechanism. Now, there are some other candidates for taste. Now, there's no doubt that we sense these things. I guess the debate is more around whether they count as a taste, i.e. is it purely a taste-based thing or is it another sensation? So I'm gonna to refer to all of these as tastes just to be straightforward, but these aren't confirmed tastes. So the first one of these is fats. Now, fats are so important in cooking and typically the more of them you use, the better something is going to taste. If you skimp out on fats, your food's gonna taste quite bland. So don't shy away from them. Another one of these sensations is the taste of metallic. We all know what that's like. Astringency, so this is quite an interesting one. So astringency is one that is kind of more of a general sense and it relates to a feeling of dryness and kind of graininess in the mouth. It's typically caused when we have compounds that bind to proteins in our saliva that reduce the ability of it to lubricate, causing that sensation of dryness and roughness. So the next one, and many people's favorite, and I would add this to as many foods as I can, is heat. So heat is a fantastic sense, and it's triggered by a molecule and molecules like capsaicin. It binds to something in our mouths, and sometimes at the other end, that triggers the sensation of heat. And a lot of us get a kick from this, and it's really wonderful, and we feel kind of energized after it, and it boosts our mood. They're really good for you. They improve so much. They bring a whole new dimension to a dish. Pepperiness can be another one. Uh, it's no coincidence that it's one of our two main seasonings in the Western world. And the last one of these extra tastes is those of mustard. It's caused by compounds called isothiocyanates, and they cause a real burning sensation in our mouth that's distinct from pepper. Now, I know a lot of people who add mustard and similar things to a lot of different dishes because it's simply a sensation that you can't get any other way. And it again brings another level and another dimension of flavor to a dish and chefs love it and use it a lot. So all told, that's 12 different tastes and chefs will consider many of these when they're putting together a dish, not just the typical five, but that's not all because within each taste there's differences. So different acids taste different. Citric acid and that of lemon juice taste different to vinegar. As we've covered, different salts taste different. We can use sea salt in particular to elevate a dish. Different bitter compounds taste different. Those in coffee, those in tonic water, those in chocolate, those in bitter salad leaves, all create a different perception of bitterness. Again, chefs take advantage of this. Clearly, clearly, there's a lot more going on than just the five basic tastes. And you know what? Your brain loves it when you explore them. So where does that leave us with deliciousness? What's the secret if it isn't for umami? Well, let's look at these foods again and explore how they're made and see if we can expose some other commonality between them. So soy sauce, this is a product that has gone through the Maillard process. So that's roasting, generates a huge amount of flavor. Then we have enzymatic breakdown and fermentation and it's left for a very long time. That's a lot of molecular breakdown producing a lot of flavor. Marmite is a huge one in the UK and one that's incredibly popular with a lot of people. And it's a large part of English culture. It was even reported to have helped the Allies win World War I. It was included in ration packets because it's so nutritionally dense. Now Marmite is a really interesting one in how it's made. So it's called yeast extract and it's produced from the leftover waste from making beer. They add salt and apply a lot of heat to it to create the breakdown and cell death of the yeast cells, which then release all of their innards and all of those really important flavor producing compounds that are important to life. After that, we have extreme reduction. So it's really, really concentrated. This, 6% salt. If you put that amount of salt in a glass of water and try to drink it, it's extremely unpalatable. Not in Marmite. Finally, Marmite is aged, just to compound all of that flavor producing loveliness. Here we have fish sauce. So the production of fish sauce historically is an enzymatic process. So the innards of fish guts are all broken down with the rest of the fish 
and those enzymes that were there to digest things that it ate then digest its own body, again producing a plethora of flavour molecules. Next up we have Parmesan. So Parmesan is famous for its level of MSG and it's packed with huge amounts of flavour and it has many uses and is a favourite well outside of Italy. And case in point, if you take 36 month aged Parmesan and compared it to say 12 month Parmesan and just simply added some extra MSG to it, it is not going to taste anywhere near as good as 36 month old Parmesan. There's a lot more going on than just the production of MSG in this. Now miso is a big one, it's a flavour bomb. It contains a lot of MSG and a lot of other flavour. It also, as I mentioned earlier, contains kukumi. It has a lot of uses, it's very versatile and it's well loved. It's produced by enzymatic breakdown and fermentation, so it's aged that further creates complexity in its flavour. All of these are delicious flavour bombs and all of them are the result of long time honoured processes that generate flavour by the breakdown of proteins and carbohydrates and are rich in a host of other life-giving molecules. And we sense these many, many flavours so richly in our mouths and in our noses through our many, many receptors. For all of these, chemically and biologically complex processes create the heaps of flavour in these and thousands upon thousands of molecules. Those complex processes is the real fire of flavour. Okay then, what about the tomato? Well, these tomatoes are here because of evolution, which is the most complex of complex processes. Tomatoes co-evolve with us and other animals to be delicious. Nightshades have gone through many iterations of a fruit to produce something that, when you take it off a vine in the heat of summer, is incredibly hard to beat. Okay, so we've gone over all of these really long processes that generate lots of flavour. So where then do donuts get their flavour from? These cook in minutes and we don't produce any MSG in that time. But so rich are these in sugar and fat being basically pure energy and at least 20,000 calories on this plate alone, combined with the incredible flavour that you get from such a beautiful process like frying, these mimic nature's fruits. You get levels of complex flavour and deliciousness without needing MSG or a long process. So in summary, the takeaway is this. Just like how you should eat whole foods for your health and not take supplements, and definitely not eat a whole bowl of donuts, for real, genuine, delicious flavour, you need to think about the complex nature of the food that you're using. And understand that umami, although an incredibly important component of flavour in food, it isn't the reason, and MSG in particular, is not the reason why these foods are delicious. There's so much more going on. To say MSG is the reason these are delicious is overly reductive. They are delicious because of a whole host of complex flavours. Our brain loves chemical complexity when it comes to food and drink. So how does all of this help you cook better food? Well, if I could offer you one tip for the future, complexity would be it. Take your time, develop those flavours when you're cooking. Use sea salt and get plenty of calcium. Put some marmite in your bolognese, don't tell any Italians. Read the recipe even if you don't follow it. Don't shy away from using fat, follow your own taste and be careful which influences you get your advice on. But trust me on the complexity. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.